Every week, a group of people led by a priest named Jonathan Crow meets at the local community center. The members of this group are deeply traumatized individuals who share their stories of strange occurrences, horrible events and other negative experiences that have scarred their desperate souls. A skinny man, clearly defeated by life, tells about an ancient voice that invaded his head and forced him to take more and more drugs and alcohol. He has spent all of his money on every possible poison. Then he borrowed money and spent it again, and later started stealing to give back what he owed. Eventually it was no longer enough and, in addition to drugs, he became addicted to pain and fear. The voice ordered him to do horrifying things that he was not capable of. The troubled man was suddenly interrupted by a guy who arrived late and entered through the door. The priest reminds him reassuringly that everyone here is understanding and accepting, but he does not have to share what he does not feel comfortable with. After that, Father Crow introduces a new member of the group, an exhausted young woman Jenny who is here for the first time. Father explains to her that she might feel awkward at first, but she can fully trust those present, as they all have experienced similar things. When she is ready, she can share what is troubling her. Jenny replies that she is ready to share her story because she is in dire need of support and understanding. She says she was in great despair, so her whole family decided to go to a specified place, only to find themselves in a dark alley. There, their heads are instantly covered with bags, and they are taken to an unfamiliar grim building. An eerie voice orders them to take the bags off and they are met with a strange table and a man facing away from them. Jenny's husband Scott is instantly suspicious of what is about to come. He immediately confronts Jenny's father Alan who suggested to solve their problem by coming here. While Jenny is consoling her husband, the strange man turns to face them and, in the same eerie voice coming from underneath a terrifying mask, suggests that they begin. A round table resembling a creepy roulette wheel is surrounded by a metal chain. The characters slowly step over the chain and hesitantly position themselves around the table. The host knows that the family came here to win something that will make their dreams come true, but every game has its own rules. According to him, all of them need to stay together until everyone makes their bets that will determine whether they win or lose. When it is their turn, the players must clearly state what precisely they hope to win. They must also place a valuable item related to their desire as a bet on either red or black. When the bet is made, the host spins the wheel of fate. If the result matches the choice, the player wins, if it doesn't, then the will chooses their fate, which can be quite fickle. The host asks who wants to make the first move. In Scott's opinion, this game is utter nonsense. But Alan assures his son-in-law that they will succeed just like those who have told him about this game. To stop their argument, Jenny volunteers to be the first to play. However, as a true gentleman, Scott declares that the first move will be his. The host asks him about his desire and Jenny reveals that they have lost their little daughter. Scott places a lock of his daughter's hair on red and says that he just wants to bring her back. The host spins the wheel, and it slowly stops on black. The table claims the lock of hair and Scott declares in defeat that he was right all along and this whole idea was a bunch of nonsense. He is about to leave when Jenny's mother remarks that if it is indeed nonsense, there is no harm in trying again. Scott comes back and Jenny's mother retrieves a cross that she was going to gift her granddaughter for her baptism. She puts the cross on red and wishes for her granddaughter to return safe and sound. In the meantime, Scott notices that he is bleeding from the back of his head. All of a sudden, he lets out a frantic scream and begins to peel the skin off his face. He falls and chokes on blood. Frightened, the family members ask what is happening to him and the host lets them know that he is lost, and the bets in this game are final. According to him, Alan should know this for sure. The wheel stops on black again, the cross disappears, and the evil spirit drags Jenny's mom into the darkness. Alan yells angrily at the host, demanding his wife's return but the host calmly explains that they volunteered to play, and the rules must be followed. Alan promises to kill him, but Jenny asks her father to place the bet and attempt to save her mother and Scott. Alan takes out a small straw doll but throws it on the floor. After that, he takes off his wedding ring, bets it on black and asks the host to return everything that he has taken from him. Finally, fortune smiles upon them and the wheel stops on black. Scott immediately comes to his senses and right behind him appears Alan's wife holding his granddaughter cozily wrapped in a blanket. Jenny excitedly snatches her from her mother but instantly realizes that the child is dead. She furiously screams at the host, but he replies that it was determined by the wheel of fate, and he is nothing more than its obedient servant. All of a sudden Jenny notices her father's wallet with a picture of her daughter on the table and asks why it is here. The host reminds them that Alan has asked to get everything that was taken from him back. Jenny remembers her father's words that he has lost the wallet. She demands the truth from her father about what he has done. Alan proceeds to tell her that he was told about this game by a friend of his. He did not believe him at first, and to make matters even worse, they were also drunk. He bet all of the contents of his wallet. And so it happened that his granddaughter appeared to be a part of the bet too. Jenny instantly realizes that she has lost her daughter due to some stupid bet and yells at her father in rage. 
he begs for her forgiveness and explains that he has tried to bring her back. According to him, there is nothing left to do now to fix it. Her parents leave and Jenny calls her father a coward. Scott tries to console his wife and suggests leaving too, but Jenny replies that she is not leaving without her daughter. Jenny pushes her husband beyond the chain, bets her father's wallet on red and asks to have her daughter back. She tries to spin the wheel herself but gets burned. The host clarifies that one cannot bet what has already been lost. Then Jenny declares that she bets herself, spilling her blood right on her daughter's picture. The host spins the wheel and it stops on red. At once, everything is plunged into darkness, and once it dissipates, Jenny sees life fill her daughter again. Trying to find Scott, Jenny turns around and sees how he, along with her parents, is slowly drained of life, and all of them are gradually rising to the sky. In disbelief, Jenny does not understand what is happening, after all she has won. But the host reminds her that no one must leave the table until the game is over. Jenny begs him to give her another chance, but the host replies that she has already lost enough and the game is over. All of a sudden everything vanishes, and Jenny and her daughter appear in an unfamiliar abandoned building, making her way through overgrown weeds, she finds herself in the middle of a street in broad daylight. At the group meeting, Jenny goes on to say that she has come back to that place every day to find nothing but an empty room. The police did not believe her. Eventually, she had to admit that it never happened to not risk being declared insane and losing custody of her child. But three people cannot vanish into thin air like that. In an attempt to support Jenny, Father Crow assures her that he believes her, just like everyone else in the room. After all, this is the reason why this group exists, for people who have faced something that is hard to believe. Father thanks everyone for the courage to share their stories and suggests praying. Seeing the group off, he reminds everyone of the meeting next week. Jenny doubts that she will come again, but Father shakes her hand tightly and insists on her return. Left alone, Father enters the church and begins to pray. All of a sudden, he hears a loud noise behind his back, which frightens him terribly. He goes to his room and tries to wash his fear down with wine. Out of fear, his hands are shaking and he is short of breath. Wine doesn't really help and the priest is struggling to calm down, that's how scared he is. On the brick of hysteria, but having pulled himself together a little, father returns to the altar reluctantly. He falls to his knees and desperately keeps drinking wine out of the bottle. Father attempts to pray again and begs God to be merciful to him, but suddenly that same game host appears behind his back. Despite the demon looking terrifying, the priest is not surprised by his appearance. The demon says that all the answers to the eternal questions are almost within reach. He is just not looking in the right places, and he just needs to have faith. Father nervously interrupts the demon saying that he has faith. He also adds that he has gathered all those people together already and does not understand what else he needs from him. The demon replies that he himself is the darkness that devours the light, he himself is the despair that crushes their hope, and he has huge plans for his congregation, especially the priest. Fleshy saliva runs down the demon's chin, and the priest freezes in horror. 